the classified and bitter truth is that Confed has been losing the war this past year. So, this should be looked upon as the Confederation's last ditch effort to win the war outright. The Terran Kilrathi War had entered its final stages by 2668. The Terran Confederation Navy had lost up to a third of its active carriers over the course of three months, and over half the entire fleet in nine. The warriors of the Kilrathi Empire were fully aware of their new advantage, and had begun fighting even more viciously against an already beleaguered confederation. The situation was grim for humanity. They did not have the means to replace their losses quickly enough to keep them in the war indefinitely. Despite their recent ad hoc solution to convert heavy transports into escort carriers to fill the gaps in their force projection capabilities, both Confed Navy and Space Forces remained vastly outnumbered. If something did not change soon for the Terran Confederation, the subjugation of humanity was all but certain. No one understood this more than Admiral Bainbridge. He, along with the rest of the Confed Admiralty, were desperately searching for a solution to reverse the fortunes of war. In his search, he had come across a backwater and unimportant system called Vukar Tog located within the Kilrathi Empire. What made this system noticeable was the number of Kilrathi fleet assets that were assigned to protect the only habitable planet in the system. In fact, it was so heavily fortified that two out of the three attempts to conduct orbital reconnaissance of the planet were met with the destruction of the Terran ships and crew involved. But the last recon attempt by a plucky corvette named the Johnny Green succeeded where the others did not. What they found was a large Kilrathi castle sticking out amongst the otherwise barren surface. Eventually, Confed intelligence analysts and Kilrathi cultural experts were able to crack the mystery of what this castle was. Vukar Tog was the ancestral home to the Kilrathi Emperor's mother, Dowager Empress Graknala Narkaranka. Oh, that's a name. In addition, the Kilrathi people regarded the planet as sacred, and by their own rules of war was considered to be strictly off-limits. Even throughout the multitude of civil wars in Kilrathi history, no kill had ever violated this rule. Confed intelligence surmised that any attempt to annex and fortify Vukar Tog would force an overwhelming military response from the Kilra home fleet, which consisted of the elite Kilrathi Imperial Guard, the Drakai. This was for two reasons, the first being the aforementioned violation of their rules of war, while the other had its roots in Kilrathi society and culture. The Kilrathi Empire was essentially a feudal government with different Kil clans constantly jockeying for political advantage over their adversaries, through means both subtle and overt. The Narkarankas were the current ruling clan of Kilra, of which the Emperor was a member of. However, this position could easily be taken by one of the other rival clans through whatever means of political intrigue the Kilrathi lords deemed acceptable. Why is this important? By letting the Confed Apes violate a planet deemed sacred by their religion, and that acted as home to the Dowager Empress, and if there was no response to this desecration, it would be seen by the other rival clans as a show of weakness by the Narkarankas, which would allow their enemies to act against them to such a degree that it could possibly destabilize the Empire. In summary, a military response was guaranteed. So, Admiral Bainbridge came to the conclusion that an assault on Vukar Tog could be useful to lead a significant portion of the active Kilrathi fleet into a trap. But one factor prevented the Confederation Navy and Space Forces from engaging in an out-and-out -out brawl against the Kilrathi. Numbers. Confed forces were greatly outnumbered across every theater of war, and that reality would undoubtedly be the same as the Kilrathi could bring enough ships to make the odds 3 to 1 in their favor. A number that would only increase exponentially as battlefield losses mounted and TCN carriers would be lost in combat. At that point, the Terrans would be forced into a retreat and the annihilation of the Terran Confederation would be all but certain. But perhaps, Bainbridge and his staff theorized, there could be another way to use the future annexation of Vukar Tog, one that could use the new Wake-class escort carriers in a way the Kilrathi would never expect, and that could dramatically turn the tides of war in humanity's favor. One of these new escort carriers was the TCS Tarawa, fresh out of the shipyards and awaiting the arrival of her new wing commander. Jason Bear Bondarevsky. Jason was a combat veteran with a strong moral code and sense of duty. 
This combination of values was what led to him participating in the Gettysburg Mutiny, an event where the pilots of the TCS Gettysburg refused an order from their commanding officer to fire upon Kilrothy civilians, which kicked off the mutiny. After the event was resolved, Admiral Towin himself was so impressed by the man's character and skill in the cockpit that Jason would spend a tour of duty aboard the TCS Concordia, and when his time was up aboard Towin's flagship, he would be promoted to wing commander of the Tarawa. On the opposite end of the spectrum was Captain Thaddeus O'Brien, a man who spent 20 years of the war captaining transports for Confed before being moved back to Earth for desk duty. His position aboard the Tarawa only gained through the fact that he had a hand in the design of the Wake class. O'Brien was also a petty man, often giving in to his dislike of the frontline service people who he believed looked down upon men like him. He was also a political climber, only serving in the Navy to further his own ambitions. He gratefully accepted the assignment to the Tarawa only because it was a surefire, low-risk way to get a red combat tab on his record in order to aid in his ascent through the ranks. As on paper, the Waukee escort carriers were mainly to be used for fighter transport behind the front lines. But Jason would not be alone. Many of those who served aboard the Concordia were also transferred to the Tarawa, such as his friend Etienne Doomsday Montclair, which was some comfort to the new wing commander, as the flight wing he was assigned to consisted almost entirely of rookie pilots fresh out of the academy to cover for Confed's recent losses on the front. But even if they were not going to be fighting in the most heavily contested sectors of the war, Jason fully intended to make sure his pilots would be ready for when they would be called upon. In retrospect, it was a prudent decision. Three weeks of continual drills and training exercises followed, with the mostly green pilots beginning to slowly improve from their first few disastrous sorties, as Doomsday noted. But still, Jason countered, they were far from being as combat ready as he would like, but any more training would have to wait. For the past few weeks, the Tarawa had been escorting a transport convoy housing the Confederation 1st Marine Battalion, the Cat Killers, to a planet for training exercises. So far, it was an uneventful run, which was what allowed for Jason the luxury of training his pilots, but now, their mission was about to change. The Commandant of the Battalion, Big Duke Greco, who was aboard one of the convoy ships, met with O'Brien, who then briefed Jason and the crew. He informed them that their original orders were just a smokescreen. Now that they were closer to their actual destination, they could be briefed on the real mission, which was to assault the world of Vukar Tog within Kilrathi space. There, the Marines would capture a castle located on the planet's surface by a previous recon mission, with the Tarawa Flight Wing providing air and space support. Another wake carrier, the Sevastopol, would join them along the way to assist the Tarawa. En route to Vukar Tog, Jason was worried. He was going into battle within the Kilrathi Empire alongside pilots who were mostly inexperienced, although the drills and exercises he put them through helped alleviate some of his fears. But the truth was too hard to ignore. They were undoubtedly going to lose some people. As the Tarawa, the Sevastopol, and the Marine Battalion transports jumped into Vukar Tog, the flight wing immediately launched. Initially, no Kilrathi ships or defenses were found, and the go-ahead was given for the Marines to move further in towards the planet. But that quickly changed as 50 missile launches were detected from the planet of Vukar Tog, aimed right for the Marine detachment. Scrambling, Jason and his pilots intercepted the missiles, preventing all but one from reaching their intended targets. With this, the first phase of the assault was now complete. Now it was time to put Plan Bravo into effect. Over the course of several hours, the assault seemed to go almost flawlessly. The rapiers and sabers took out the Kilrathi anti-air batteries and the barracks that contained the majority of their soldiers. The battle for the skies was fought with much more ferocity. The Terrans were also able to eventually gain the upper hand and overwhelm the cat fighters. Now that the skies were clear, the marines began landing, eager to finalize the Terran conquest of the Kilrathi planet. Observing the situation from above in his rapier, Bear Bondarevsky detected a burst signal from a nearby Kilrathi transmitter lasting only a second. But as Jason reported that he was going to investigate, a direct order from General Big Duke himself forbade him from doing so. Confused, but unwilling to press the issue due to his low fuel, Jason made for space. 
back aboard the Tarawa, Jason went through the reports and comm chatter. His pilots performed admirably well, with them only losing a co-pilot and a gunner, along with two injured. All things considered, they did far better than average for a mission of this type. Of course, he would never actually tell them that, though. Over 12 hours after the battle, the Tarawa and Marine Commando Unit were ordered to pull back to the Niven Sector inside Confed space for unexplained reasons. But once they arrived through the jump point in Niven, the sight they beheld was one they were not expecting. The Confederation fleet, the biggest assemblage of ships in over half a dozen years, awaited them. Whatever was going to happen next was going to be big. Jason Bondarevsky and Commodore O'Brien would soon find out, as they had been summoned for a briefing with Admiral Bainbridge aboard the TCS Concordia. There, an assortment of captains, commodores, and admirals awaited what Bainbridge had to say, including Admiral Jeffrey Tolwyn, who greeted Bear as he entered the briefing room. The assemblage did not have long to wait, as Admiral Bainbridge came in soon after. He began with announcing the capture of Vukar Tog and how this was the start of what was codenamed Operation Backlash. The real plan, as it were, was never to hold Vukar Tog, but instead to act as bait for the Kilrathi home fleet, the Drakai, into an ambush due to the planet's religious and political significance, as any lack of challenge to Confed's taking of Vukar Tog would jeopardize the Emperor's position, the launch of their Drakai fleet was guaranteed and once they began their assault to retake the planet from the Terran Marine station there, the Confed fleet at Niven would jump into the system and ambush the Kilrathi. It was a bold plan, Jason admitted to himself, but the risks and potential costs seemed remarkably high for someone like Bainbridge. Losses would inevitably be incurred on both sides, and with a future battle for Vukar Tog turned against them, Confed could be in a much worse position than they were previously. These doubts of his would eventually be answered, as after the briefing, an ensign directed him to follow her for a private meeting with Bainbridge, Tolwyn, O'Brien, Captains Grierson and Tang, and Colonel Merritt from the 1st Marine Battalion. When Bainbridge asked Jason about his opinion of the plan, he brought forward his concerns and what could potentially go wrong. To the shock of everyone except the Admirals present, Bainbridge agreed with Jason's opinion. According to him, computer simulations of the Battle of Vukar Tog confirmed everything Jason brought to light, and if the fleet did lose as many ships as predicted, the war would essentially be lost. But from those projections came a plan. If the Kilrathi fleet heading to Vukar Tog could be forced to divide their numbers before the battle, the Confederation fleet could potentially clean their clocks. As such, Bondarevsky, O'Brien, Tang, Grierson, and Merritt would be leading the newly created Strike Force Valkyrie with the mission being the attack of Kilra itself, perhaps the only condition on which the Kilrathi would split their forces. Jason and O'Brien would be in charge of the Tarawa Flight Wing and the Tarawa respectively. Teng, his corvette, the TCS Kagimasha, along with Captain Grierson's destroyer, the TCS Intrepid, would comprise the rest of the ship elements for Strike Force Valkyrie. Merritt would be in charge of marine ground operations while based on the Tarawa. The objectives of Strike Force Valkyrie was to attack Kilrathi production capabilities in the system, which was mainly centered around Kilra's second moon. As the vast majority of the Kilra home fleet would be committed to the Battle of Vukar Tog, it would allow the Tarawa and the others to slip in and wreak havoc on their war materiel and infrastructure. If both the attack on Kilra and Vukar Tog were successful, the Confederation would be well on its way to being on equal footing with the Kilrathi Empire again. Captain O'Brien would be given overall command of the Strike Force as acting Commodore. However, his brief emotional high upon hearing that was immediately dashed when Bainbridge explained that, one, there would be no plans for exfiltration on the fleet's part, so the Strike Force would have to escape on its own. And two, they were expendable. Obviously, a man whose aspirations involved a comfortable position within Confed was utterly terrified at this turn of events. But as the briefing concluded and the participants began to return to their duties, Tolan took Bear aside for a quick discussion off the record. He explained his regrets in recommending him, Doomsday, and the others from the Concordia to the Tarawa due to their previous service under his command. Tolan did not know the assignment he would be sending his comrades in arms into at the time, as he was only told to pick out his best people for a new command. But perhaps it was just as well they were assigned to this mission due to one factor. O'Brien. Tolwyn knew the man did not have the strength or fortitude to lead an operation that could very well be suicide. 
an assessment that Jason agreed with. Tolwyn had previously brought up his concerns to Bainbridge, but for whatever reason kept him on. With the explanations over, Jeffrey Tolwyn promised his friend two things. That he would do everything in his power, including bring his ship the Concordia to the strike force in order to get them out. Orders be damned, as in his words, a country that abandons its soldiers and does nothing to save them isn't worth a pinch of owl dung. O'Brien was a liability. If the man were to crack during the operation, as both Tolwyn and Jason feared, then Tolwyn would support Jason forcefully removing him from command in order to guarantee their success. It was a situation Jason Bondarevsky hoped he would not find himself in. Again. Five days later aboard the Tarawa, Strike Force Valkyrie had entered the Gamark II system to initiate the first stage of the plan, telling the Kilrathi they were coming. This first stage was critical. If the Kilrathi were not aware of the Strike Force, the Kilrathi fleet en route to Vukar would not split their forces, and the Confed fleet would be forced to take on their full might in a battle they would lose. To that end, Bear would personally take a ferret out for a recon mission, with active radar scan on to maximize his chances of being seen by the Kilrathi base in the current system they were in. The Kilrathi were quick to detect him, and sortied six Sartha light fighters after him. The chase was on. The plan was to have the Sarthas tail Jason until they caught sight of the Tarawa strike force. At that point, the Sarthas would follow standard procedure and head back to base, where the Kilrathi would bring in their heavy fighters and weaponry. But by that point, the Tarawa and her escorts would already be jumping out system. Unless a complication came up, which it did. O'Brien, terrified of his ship being attacked, ordered a combat flight out to destroy the Sarthas before they could send word back to their base of Confed's presence in the system. Jason was beginning to lose patience with the man. It was crucial to the mission that the Kilrathi see the strike force, so he decided to take matters into his own hands. He proceeded to open a private communications channel to the flight leader of the incoming Tarawa fighters, who just happened to be his old pal Doomsday. Bear told Doomsday to retreat back to the Tarawa with him and re-engage with the Sarthas at 10,000 kilometers out from their carrier, but leave at least one Kilrathi fighter alive so that they would see the Tarawa and have a chance to escape and report back to their superiors. This would mean a direct subversion of O'Brien's authority by Bear. There would be hell to pay for sure. But Doomsday, also knowing the importance of what they were doing, agreed to the new plan. Now all Jason had to do was survive, as the Sarthas gained distance on him. But on cue at the 10,000 click mark, Doomsday's fighters turned around and began engaging Kilrathi, and despite a close call, one of the Sarthas managed to see the Tarawa and beat a hasty retreat. Bear, upon his return to the carrier, was confronted by a furious O'Brien at this creative interpretation of his direct orders. The two entered into a heated argument in the wardroom, O'Brien promising that he would have his stripes for what he pulled, and would order the strike force to withdraw back to Confed space. But Jason countered that the mission parameters needed the Kilrathi to know they were coming, Otherwise, the fleet at Vukar Tog would be utterly decimated by the full force of the Kilrathi home fleet. In the heat of the moment, Jason pressed further, inferring that O'Brien was a coward who cared more about his own life than those of everyone else in the Vukar Tog fleet. But the Commodore was unmoved by his argument and committed to the withdrawal. Or at least he would have, if not for the timely appearance of Captain Grierson from the Destroyer Intrepid. He wanted to congratulate Bear on pulling off such a convincing performance to the Kilrathi, and wanted to relay the fact that both himself and Captain Tang aboard the Kagimasha believed that the best course of action was to proceed further inward to Kilrathi space. O'Brien, not wanting to challenge a ship captain, simply nodded his agreement, leaving Grierson to order the Tarawa bridge crew to make for flank speed to the jump point, Jason having narrowly avoided being grounded by the Tarawa captain. Afterwards, Grierson spoke to Bear privately. The captain of the Intrepid knew what O'Brien had wanted to do, and said emphatically that he would be damned if some coward kills a lot of my friends at Vukar and brings down the Confederation just to save his lousy hide. His parting words to Jason being, Stay sharp, son, and for God's sake stay alive. You're the one counter we've got against him aboard this ship. Back on Kill Ra, Prince Thrakath was pondering the video footage from Gamark II. Imperial intelligence estimated that the Confed strike force was certainly heading for Kill Ra itself. Such a suicidal attack was almost unthinkable for a Terran, but did this perhaps have something to do with the Confed Marines currently occupying and defiling the Dowager Empress's palace on Vukar Tog? 
Before he could consider this further, his thoughts were interrupted by three Kilrathi nobles, Baron Jukagan, Kalralars, Rusmak, and Gar. The two Kalralars, true to their noble warrior heritage, were disgusted by both the attack on Vukar Tog and the fleet en route to Kilra. When Thrakath brought forth the question of how both events were to fit together in whatever plan the Confed apes were plotting, they dismissed such a connection. Such attacks were clearly born of desperation and revenge, as within a year's time it was projected that the Kilrathi Empire would be standing triumphant over the charred husk of Earth. Baron Jukaga, however, proposed something very unorthodox for Kilrathi. He stated that perhaps the strike at Vukar Tog was an attempt to force the Drakai home fleet to sortie and leave Kilra. How did he suspect this? The carrier that was detected en route to them was the same carrier that participated in the initial assault on Vukar Tog. According to his assessment of the situation, there were two options. Split the home fleet between two groups, with one continuing on to Vukar Tog and the other heading back to Kilra. The second, have the entire fleet come back to Kilra to meet this Confed strike force. The Kalralars responded to the second option with scorn and derision, stating that Imperial Honor demanded that they retake Vukar Tog, and if they held off the Vukar assault too long, Confed would fortify the planet enough to the point where their Imperial legions would suffer unthinkable losses. No, the plan of the cowardly humans were simple. They wanted to bleed the Empire in retaking Vukar Tog. Jukaga stood by his words, and re-emphasized that Vukar was just bait, as the Confederation obviously knew of the planet's importance to Kilrathi honor. As Jukaga had long since studied the Terrans, he cautioned that they should never be approached with contempt. Openly, the other three Kilrathi mocked the Baron's opinion of the Confed apes. But secretly, Thrakath knew he was right, at least to an extent. The home fleet had to be divided between Kilra and Vukar for the good of Imperial honor. So Thrakath ordered three of the ten carriers en route to Vukar to return to Kilra, where he personally would lead the defense against the Terran strike force. Back in Niven aboard the TCS Wolfhound, Admiral Bainbridge's flagship, Admiral Jeffrey Tolwyn stopped by to visit his old friend. After some pleasantries and updates about the marine fortification of Vukar Tog, Tolwyn came to the real reason for his visit. After the upcoming battle, he intended to take his ship, the Concordia, and use her to get Strike Force Valkyrie out of Kilrathi space. Bainbridge refused. Even if they did win here at Vukar Tog, they were almost definitely going to lose at least one carrier. The Confederation fleet could not afford one of their heavy carriers to simply go off on its own to rescue a carrier group that had already been deemed expendable. Their forces were already spread thin enough across the theaters of war as it was. If the Concordia was damaged bad enough to be forced into dry dock or even destroyed, the war itself could be jeopardized. Tolwyn understood, but remained defiant, stating that this whole thing stinked to holy hell and Bainbridge knew it. But before they could continue their conversation, Bainbridge was interrupted by a report that the Kilrathi had begun entering Vukar Tog. As the Battle of Vukar was beginning, Strike Force Valkyrie had just entered the Kilra system, their only resistance so far being a single corvette and a collection of fighters. But by the Kilrathi moon that was to be their target, three corvettes and over 20 fighters were amassing to stop their advance. The Tarwa pilots scrambled quickly, their weeks of training and experience on Vukar evident in the smooth launching of their planes. Together with the intrepid in Kagimasha, the Tarawa fighters were able to quickly turn the tables on the Kilrathi. Jason almost couldn't believe how easy everything was going. So far, no carriers had been detected, and with his pilots mopping up the last of the cats, Bear took the initiative and brought his rapier down to the moon for a quick recon and immediately hit pay dirt. A massive shipyard consisting of six carrier dockyards protected by Durasteel bunkers, along with an assortment of other fighter and cruiser factories as well. The second moon of Kilra was indeed the target of opportunity the Admiralty was hoping for. Once Jason returned to the Tarawa, the battle was already over. In the ward room with Captain O'Brien and Jason, Marine Colonel Merritt was ecstatic over what Bear found on the moon. Merritt's plan was to take his Cat Killers Battalion down to the surface and place matter antimatter mines inside each part of the facility and the carriers to get past the shielding of the bunkers. His estimated timetable for the operation was placed at 30 hours. O'Brien wasn't happy, of course. 
Instead, he argued for a quick and easy orbital bombardment of the moon, regardless of how ineffectual it would be thanks to the Durasteel bunkers. And afterwards, it would be followed by a few missiles sent to Kilra itself on the way out system. O'Brien's motivations were obvious, as all three men in that meeting knew that the Kilrathi carriers from Vukar Tog could be on them at any time. Unwilling to take no for an answer, Merritt reminded O'Brien that he was in charge of ground operations, and that they were going to launch. His rationale to O'Brien ending with, Either you bring this ship into launch and support range, or by God I will shoot you right here and do it myself. O'Brien seethed, but carried out the Marines' request. Hours later, the Kagimasha and Intrepid were bombarding the planet's surface, with the marines launching from the Tarawa with their fighter escorts in tow. Diving into the planet, the Confederation warriors flew through the Kilrathi AA fire. The marines able to land at their designated points amongst the shipyard and began engaging the Kilrathi forces. But as the battle proceeded on the ground, the battle in space was taking a turn for the worse. Tarawa combat information contacted Baron reported that they were under attack by Kilrathi fighters and at least one Kilrathi heavy carrier with supporting ships were inbound to their position. Captain Grierson listening in confirmed their approach, and estimated their arrival at little over three hours. Merritt's original timetable would have to be sharply readjusted, with Bear relaying the information back to the Marines that now they had only three hours to plant their mines on the carriers and exfiltrate off the planet. But there was still the issue of the Tarawa, where the attack on the carrier was beginning to intensify heavily, Something was bound to snap, and it did. O'Brien, terrified of this sudden turn of events, began a full retreat at best speed to the exit jump point. The Marines were expendable, and so were any pilots who couldn't make it back to the Tarawa in time before the jump. In a heated conversation over the comms with the captain, Jason, so outraged at the fact that this sniveling man would abandon so many of their own comrades in arms, threatened to kill him if he ever got aboard that ship. But this was no empty threat in the heat of the moment. Jason began maneuvering his ship to land aboard the Tarawa flight deck. This ship would not abandon their people, no matter the cost. Once back aboard, Bear rushed through the main halls towards the bridge. But whatever dramatic and final confrontation between the two opposing men was not to be. As he was closing in on the bridge, a violent explosion forced the ship to convulse and heave, sending Jason to the ground. By the time he recovered, he realized he was staring out into empty space, where the bridge used to be. Only one course of option was left to him, and it was something Bear had hoped he would not have to do. Returning to the hangar, he informed the flight deck officer that they would have to convert his command center into a temporary bridge, and to make a note in the log that he, Jason Bondarevsky, as sole surviving senior most officer, was taking command of the Tarawa, with his first order being to get them back into the fight. The first task was to get the marines off the Kilrathi moon. The Intrepid herself had already finished landing operations to pick up two marine crews and were now taking on more marines from landing craft arriving to dock the destroyer. Merritt, still on the ground with his men, reported that they had attached mines to five of the carriers under construction and in the cruiser assembly building, but they needed five more minutes to get all of his people off planet. The complication to this, of course, was the Kilrathi fleet bearing down on them with their fighters estimated to arrive in less than 15 minutes, but Jason still refused to leave their own behind and would give the marines their five minutes. Eventually, the last of the landing craft made it back aboard the Tarawa, and with the first Kilrathi fighters on top of them, the battered ships of Strike Force Valkyrie were now faced with a dilemma. The Kilrathi had begun to blockade the jump point out system. Not that the Tarawa could jump out anyway, as the jump drives were damaged from the prior attack on the bridge. Then there was still the Kilrathi fleet headed by that heavy carrier that was currently en route to them. Faced with no obvious options, Captain Bondarevsky made his own, head further into the Kilross system towards a gas giant that may provide the temporary relief from their pursuers that they needed. Relaying his orders to the intrepid in Kagimasha, all three ships proceeded at full acceleration to the gas giant. But even this action would not guarantee their survival. Over the hours long journey, the Kilrathi never relented in their pursuit with running battles between Confed and Imperial fighters, eventually escalating into long-range laser volleys between the Strike Force and the Kilrathi destroyers closing in. But finally, they had to reach the gas giant, guarded by a lone and unarmed Kilrathi space station that the Intrepid destroyed easily. The Strike Force now needed to cover their tracks, so Jason ordered Merritt, now aboard the Tarawa, to load one of the remaining matter-antimatter mines aboard a landing craft and set it on autopilot behind them. 
As the three ships dove into the upper atmosphere to conceal themselves, Merritt triggered the explosive. The idea was that the electromagnetic pulse generated from the explosion would disrupt the Kilrathi sensors and would thus lose track of their prey. Their gamble had worked, as was hoped, and with the Kilrathi having lost the scent, they had bought the time they needed to repair their ships and plot their next move. Two days later, despite the ongoing repairs, the Tarawa was still worse for wear. Much of the ship was still unsuitable for the crew without pressure suits, and the main structure had cracks in three of the six main keel beams. Then there were the innumerable holes all over the ship causing her to leak air constantly. But the shield generators were back up to 75%, and bridge controls were fully routed now to their improvised bridge. Their pilots, on the other hand, were now down to 23, and their planes down to 20, which was roughly half the tar was original complement for both. Due to the losses and Jason's need to command the carrier himself, Doomsday was promoted in his stead to wing commander of the ship. Despite the dire situation, they were as ready as they were ever going to be to attempt their escape from the Kilra system, so they began their preparations to move out. As Strike Force Valkyrie left the safety of the gas giant, they began a full acceleration course towards Kilra itself. This puzzled Thrakath, who watched from his heavy carrier in Kilra's orbit. The only possible course of action would be a suicide charge into the planet itself which would cost millions of Kilrathi lives, and the Terran crews in the process. But the apes would never commit to something like that if it meant their own lives, would they? But he could not take the chance. Thrakath immediately ordered Kilra's planetary shield to go up, and have their fighters scramble for point defense. As the strike force accelerated faster and faster towards the planet, the Tarawa launched two ships on autopilot a ferret and a marine landing craft, both armed with atomic warheads. The reason? They would be detected by the Kilrathi sensors, assume there were missiles, and force themselves to scramble in a direction away from the strike force. The Valkyrie ships were even closer now, and as the Kilrathi moved towards the decoys, all three ships began adjusting their course to loop around Kilra without slowing down, which was a risky maneuver that required precise nav calculations to pull off. There was no room for a margin of error. All the while the Sartha fighters were hot in their tails and closing in, one of which was able to close in on the Kagimasha and ram her, the corvette instantly going up in an explosive cloud. There would be time to mourn later. The survivors still needed to finish this crazy stunt to escape. Their next step involved using their tractor beams on Kilra itself to adjust their course and perform a slingshot maneuver to put them on course for the jump point leading out system. The tractor beams were never meant for this kind of work, but luck seemed to favor the Terrans and the Intrepid and Tarawa were able to slingshot their way to the jump point. And with their speed and the diversion of the main Kilrathi fleet, they now had a 5 million kilometer plus head start on their enemies. Congratulations and cheers went on throughout the bridge, as the crew realized they had hit Kilron so far lived long enough to escape. But Captain Jason Bondarevsky knew better. This was an alternate jump point they were heading to that would take them on a different course than the one prescribed by Confed. And as intelligence about the jump lanes in Kilrathi space were virtually unknown, they could end up in a much worse situation. Yes, they had outrun the cats, but they were no closer to home. But for now, he and the crew had bought themselves some breathing room. In the next system, the strike force was on course for the succeeding jump point. The Kilrathi, however, had not given up the pursuit and had sent their heavy cruisers after them. But for now, they were comfortably far enough behind the Valkyrie ships. Jason, in a conference with Colonel Merritt and Captain Grierson aboard the Tarawa, all concluded that they were being shepherded into the next system, where a Kilrathi carrier was all but certain to await them. All three men agreed they were in dire straits, and if they could not escape, they would go down fighting with Jason himself stating that he would ram his ship right into any carrier they saw if escape was impossible. The moment of truth was soon upon them, and as they entered the next system, a Kilrathi heavy carrier with a supporting fleet indeed awaited them at the jump point the strike force needed to escape, and aboard that ship was none other than Prince Thrakath himself, eager to put this stain on Imperial honor to rest. In addition, two more carriers were detected as well, one in jump transit and the other on the edge of the system. It was do or die time. With their remaining strike craft, the pilots of the Tarawa launched themselves towards the Kilrathi fleet blocking their escape. It was their hope that in the ensuing conflict, the Tarawa and Intrepid could make a mad dash past the Kilrathi fleet, recover their fighters and jump out. 
Whatever fate awaited the Terrans now would be decided in the next few hours. But despite their valiant efforts, the Confed fighters could not break through. The Tarwa suffering even more catastrophic damage in the battle. What was worse was that Captain Grierson and the Intrepid had sacrificed themselves to buy the Tarwa more time against the Kilrathi capital ships that were bearing down on them. But there was little point, as a fourth carrier contact had entered the system, the Kilrathi obviously being proponents of the term overkill. The Tarwa was lost. Too much damage had been sustained. With what he thought would be his last actions, Jason ordered all hands to abandon ship and for Helm to lay in a collision course with a nearby carrier. However, this was not to be. Doomsday, back aboard, ran into the bridge to tell Jason what he learned. The fourth carrier that they detected was the TCS Concordia herself, Tolwyn making good on his promise to get Jason and the Tarawa out, despite Bainbridge's orders to the contrary. When Doomsday finished explaining their new situation, he remarked that he knew they'd make it. Quite a comment from a man who described himself as a pessimist in the best of times. In the end, the Tarawa and Concordia were able to make it back to Terran space. The Battle of Vukar Tog was a resounding success, although the losses to Confed were staggering. One of their frontline carriers was lost, and another damaged to the point of needing dry dock repairs for a year, along with seven escort ships and 96 pilots. Upon Tolwyn's return to the fleet, he was met with an infuriated Bainbridge. Tolwyn had not just defied a direct order, but forged Bainbridge's communications to make it seem that the Concordia's rescue of the Tarawa was a sanctioned action. And Tolwyn sure as hell couldn't be punished now as throwing the book at the man who rescued the first warship to strike at Kilra would be political suicide. But Tolwyn was keen to remind him that they did destroy at least five Kilrathi heavy carriers at Vukar Tog. Heavily damaged one, crippled another, and destroyed four Imperial Legions along with 20 other capital ships. Not to mention what Strike Force Valkyrie achieved, through their destruction of six more Kilrathi carriers under construction, taking out a cruiser, and the crippling of Kilrathi manufacturing on their second moon. And on top of that, there was the political fallout on the Emperor's clan that was happening as they spoke. But even if they failed, Toen continued, it was still worth it that the lads they sent out to fight this war didn't just sign on the dotted line to join the fleet. They had to know that they would stand behind them no matter what, and that any country or civilization worth fighting for would stop at nothing to bring its warriors back. But any further discussion had to wait, as they had to attend to the matters of Colonel Merritt and Captain Bondarevsky. Merritt was promoted to Brigadier General of the 1st Marine Regiment, whereas Jason would be given command of a new light carrier that was soon to be launched. But Jason refused, stating his intentions to stay with the Tarawa. When Bainbridge countered that the Tarawa was destined for the scrapyard, Tolwyn reminded his old friend that the Tarawa herself was as much a hero as the people who served aboard her, and that the public would go mad once the decision leaked out. Bainbridge agreed. Jason would be in command of a fully repaired and refitted Tarawa. The long-term results from Operation Backlash, later dubbed the End Run, cannot be overstated. In two decisive conflicts, the Terran Confederation had managed to almost reverse their inevitable and crushing defeat in the Terran Kilrathi War. But little did anyone in either the Terran Confederation or Kilrathi Empire know, but the Tarawa's end run would start a chain of events that would eventually end the war. But as always, those are other stories. <laughs> <laughs>